Greetings. This is to be a lecture on ethics, sort of an introduction to ethics. We're going to be looking at some, some terms, some concepts that are kind of fundamental to understanding um, uh, that branch of philosophy, which is ethics and ethical reasoning. And so we're sort of setting the table for a further examination of what constitutes ethical reasoning and what distinguishes ethical reasoning from other kinds of, of reasoning and uh, reasons, right? So having said that, let me begin by sharing my screen. Share screen. And what do I want? I think I want this. Share. And then I want to go to slideshow and from the beginning. I don't know what is happening here. Still don't know what's happening here. Hmm. Here we are. Okay, so this is an introduction to ethics. We're going to be looking at types of ethical theories. And then after that, we're going to be looking at a dispute uh, uh, coming to us from metaethics, which is a dispute between ethical relativism and ethical absolutism. So, so ethics uh, is basically trying to decide what one should do. Right? It deals with questions about what is right and what is wrong, what is good or bad, what should I do, what should I not do, or what kind of life should I live, what kind of life should I avoid. So these are the concerns uh, of ethics. Oops. It's sometimes referred to as practical philosophy. It deals with practice, choosing what you are going to do or should do on the basis of reason but more precisely based on moral reason. Now, sometimes when I'm choosing what to do, uh, I'm choosing what to do based on prudence. Prudence isn't um, ethical reasoning. Prudential reasoning is just thinking about what's good for me. And so I think, you know, I'm going to skip uh, the fettuccine Alfredo this evening. I'm trying to lose weight. Well, that wouldn't be an ethical decision in that instance. It would be a prudent decision. I'm concerned with my welfare. I'm concerned with preserving and promoting my welfare. And I see this action as, a, as in line with that. So that's the reason I'm acting is prudential. But ethical reasoning is not just prudential reasoning. It's something else. And so we'll be talking about what precisely is ethical reasoning. But at, at a minimum, it's not merely being concerned with own, one's own welfare. So notice when you wake up in the morning, it seems to be one of the first questions you have to ask and answer, which is, what should I do today? What shall I choose to do today? So we've talked about um, uh, different branches of philosophy, uh, natural theology, metaphysics, epistemology, of course, there are aesthetics is another branch, and um, etc. And you can maybe get through many of your days without worrying about theological questions or metaphysical questions or aesthetic questions. It's very hard to get through your day without trying to answer ethical questions. In other words, choosing what you shall do. And again, hopefully choosing what you shall do based on reason. So as ethical series, uh, let's try that again, ethical theories fall into three major categories, virtue ethics, consequentialist ethics, and deontological ethics. Um, so if you were going to file the various ethical theories that uh, we, we have in, in Western philosophy, uh, they could you would basically just need three file folders, one labeled virtue ethics, one labeled consequentialist ethics, and one labeled deontological ethics. And these are three main varieties. Uh, all are concerned with providing reasons, but what reasons they think are relevant to guiding your actions uh, differ. They differ as to what they consider the important reasons to consider. 
All right, so um, the first one we're gonna look at is virtue ethics. Now I give you definitions for each of these categories and each of the definitions begins with the same set of words, right? So all the definitions begin with a category of ethical theories which see actions as right or wrong, depending on whether or not they, so all the definitions start that way. Where the definitions differ is what comes after the they, right? So for virtue ethics, it's a category of ethical theories which see actions as right or wrong, depending on whether or not they are conducive to or flow from a good character. So we see already now central to this notion of ethics, virtue ethics, that is, is this notion of good character. And what is a good character? What constitutes a good character? And how do I develop good character? Those are the principal concerns of any virtue ethic um, that we'll be looking at. Sometimes virtue ethics is referred to as hero ethics um, in mythology. The hero usually embodies everything that that society admires or esteems. So virtue ethics would be asking something like, what would the hero do in this situation? What would a heroic person do? What would a person of, of integrity do? What would a, a decent individual do? That's what you're asking. And Or if contemplating an action, you might ask yourself, would the hero do this? Would a person of integrity do this? If the hero would do it, then you have moral reason to do it. And if the hero would avoid it, then you have moral reason to avoid it. So we've already hit upon one set of moral reasons, questions or reasons of virtue. Additionally, you might ask, would this act make me more like the hero or not? In other words, are these actions conducive to the formation of a good, heroic, admirable character? Or are they counterproductive to the formation of a good, admirable um, uh, character, right? Um, one should act in ways that are conducive to or flow from a good character or an ideal person. And one should avoid those things that are counterproductive to the formation of a good character. So not only do you ask, is this something the hero would do? In other words, does this flow from a heroic character, but also is this conducive to the formation of a heroic character? Christianity is an example of a religious virtue ethics, not strictly speaking a philosophical ethical theory though. According to this view, Jesus is the ideal and we ought to be Jesus-like and we ought to do the things that would help us be more Jesus-like and generally to do what Jesus would do. So there was a very big, um, uh, I, I, fad is perhaps the wrong word, but uh, um, there were a set of various artifacts that were produced, uh, book packs, uh, uh, um, book bags and um, backpacks and bracelets and, and, and cups, et cetera, with the uh, letters WWJD on them. Some of you may even have these items. It's not as popular as it once was, but it was very popular for a long time. And um, the WWJD stands for what would Jesus do? And the idea there is that if uh, Jesus is the hero, then you would use that as a guiding principle on what you do. Right? You would uh, choose your actions and then emulate um, the model, emulate the hero. Now, what makes this a religious and not a philosophical or secular uh, virtue ethic is that it rests on faith <clears throat> that Jesus is the ideal. So if you said, well, why do you think Jesus is the ideal? Well, often these individuals believe that Jesus was um, divine, was a God in, in, incarnate. And so uh, he exemplified the very finest uh, achievements and, and nature of humanity. Virtue ethics, oh, but if you ask, how do you know that? How do you know he's divine? They would often basically say that's a matter of faith. That's something that they believe as a matter of faith. So given that it's a matter of faith, it puts it more in the category of a religious ethic than a philosophical secular ethic. Now, virtue ethic theories do not set some minimum standard below which one ought not sink, but rather they set an ideal goal that makes judgments relative to how close one comes to the ideal. So here, the, the imperative is not, well, here's the baseline, just don't go beneath it, and then you're okay. No, the thinking for virtue ethic is strive for excellence, 
strive for, for, for perfection. The moral imperative is, uh, from this perspective is not don't break the rule, but rather strive for excellence. Virtue theory is very often employed in professional ethics. For instance, in medical ethics, often there's various uh, directives given to medical professionals and what guides those directives? They think, well, what would an ideal doctor be like? Or what would an ideal nurse be like? What would an ideal medical professional of this sort be like? And uh, you want to recommend those behaviors which are most consistent with the ideal, and you want to discourage those behaviors which are inconsistent with the ideal. Similarly, in legal ethics, you might ask, how would an ideal lawyer behave? Or what constitutes an action unbecoming a justice? Judges can be censured for behavior unbecoming a justice. And what does that mean? Well, it means something like that's just not the sort of thing that an ideal uh, justice uh, a judge would do, a judge with integrity. Um, it so happens that FIU does not have a specific rule uh, outlying or, or prohibiting faculty from dating their students. But it certainly isn't the, uh, the sort of thing that an ideal faculty member ought to be doing, in my view. And so I think what guides behavior there most often should be virtue. It, it's not a rule, but it is um, a character trait that we ought to strive towards. It's just not the sort of thing that a, an ideal instructor, an ideal educator would get involved with. It creates too many conflicts of interest and that sort of thing. Virtue ethic theories do not set some minimum standard below which one ought not sink, but rather they set an ideal goal that makes judgments relative to how close you approach the ideal. I think I said exactly that a moment ago. Oh, and I think I said this as well. Moral imperative from this perspective is not don't break the rule, but rather strive for excellence. Oh, I see why I backed up. There we go. Also, virtue ethics can be used to evaluate entire societies where we might understand a society as being uh, admirable and uh, virtuous or less than admirable. Notice uh, it is the fact that the U.S. is the only modern Western nation to still employ the death penalty. But sometimes that fact is used as sort of evidence that we're not as virtuous as we might be. When this fact is offered as a criticism of the death penalty, the tacit premise is no civilized, meaning no virtuous nation, employs the death penalty. Therefore, the suggestion is the U.S. is not as civilized as it might otherwise be, and it recommends, it's recommending that we discontinue the death penalty. Another example might be something like this, were I to say any compassionate, enlightened society would guarantee minimal health care to all of its citizens, well, then the suggestion is that if we want to be a virtuous society, we should do precisely that. And of course, that's not a that's not a hypothetical, but presumably we ought to be a virtuous society. What are some of the problems with virtue ethics? Well, one problem that uh, comes to mind immediately is what is the ideal, right? Giving the specifics of what it is, what is an ideal human? Uh, what is an ideal doctor? What is an ideal lawyer? What is an ideal instructor? What is an ideal society? So specifying the details of this ideal. Also, where do these standards come from? How do, so even if I give you, well, here's the ideal and I spell it out for you, well, you're going to ask me, where did that come from? How do you know that's the ideal? What justifies this ideal against alternatives, competitors? It may be, now notice, this may in fact be a weakness if I'm trying to use virtue ethics to prescribe the behaviors for others. And I say, well, look, this is the ideal in my opinion, and you're not living up to the ideal in my opinion. Well, that person might say, yeah, so I'm not living up to your ideal. I don't, I'm not interested in it. Why should I live up to your ideal? But notice that's a moot point if what I'm doing is assessing my own behavior, right? Because notice if I said, well, I'm not living up to my own standards. Well, that's a problem then. They're my own standards, right? So using virtue ethics as a way of examining your own conduct, evaluating your own conduct, perhaps critiquing your own conduct, I think can be very convicting, very powerful. But then a third problem is this, is there one standard for all human beings? Is there one way all human beings should be, one set of uh, virtuous ideals? 
or are there competing? Uh, maybe it's culturally relative, or uh, maybe it's more individual, or each of us is working it out on our own. Right? So that is a question that someone offering a virtue account of ethics will have to address. And even if should, such standards should exist, right, um, the most they're going to be able to do is basically give general advice on how to live your life, right, uh, guiding behavior. They're, they're not going to be able to be very, very specific of individual circumstances. It's going to be sort of general directives. One cannot very well know how one should drive one's car merely by being told, well, be courteous, be kind, be forthright, etc. I mean, all the things are, are advisable, right? I think a virtuous driver would be courteous, kind, forthright, and the rest, right? But if I'm teaching you to drive, I should also say things like stop at red stop signs and uh, drive on the right side of the road and obey the speed limit. Notice those are very specific action guiding rules. That's not quite the same thing as character traits. Uh, often we need specific action guiding rules like drive on the right side of the road. And it's not clear that a virtue ethic is going to be able to provide us with that may need to be supplemented with something else. Aristotle is an example of a virtue ethicist, and he'll be the only um, virtue ethicist that we'll be looking at in this course. Consequentialist ethics is our next category. Now, consequentialist ethics is a category of ethical theories which see actions as right or wrong, depending on whether or not they have good consequences. So whereas in virtue ethics, the moral primitive, the engine of that system is the notion of character and virtue, in consequentialist ethics, the moral primitive, the engine of these kinds of uh, ethical systems is the notion of consequences, securing good consequences. Notice if an action has good consequences, then you have reason, moral reason to perform it. And if an action has bad consequences, then you have reason, again, moral reason, to refrain from performing it. So that's certainly straightforward enough. If it has good consequences, you ought to do it. And if it has bad consequences, you ought to avoid it. Problems. Well, the problems, and maybe this has already occurred to you, is what precisely are these alleged good consequences that we should pursue? Notice pleasure, knowledge, freedom, security, happiness, well, these are all different good consequences, but sometimes, and in certain cases, they're incompatible. In other words, sometimes in order to give you knowledge, I have to tell you something that is very unpleasant to hear. Well, I can't maximize your pleasure and your knowledge at the same time in that instance. Or sometimes to protect you, your security, I have to reduce your freedom. Okay, well, then I can't pursue both consequences at the same time. Right? So if and when they conflict, which one is more important and why? Why should I pr uh, pursue freedom over security or security over freedom? And notice if I said, oh, freedom is always more important than security, that seems to presume a non-consequentialist evaluation of the consequence of freedom versus the consequence of security. So I've sort of left the consequentialist reservation at that point. So these are issues that any consequentialist theory is going to have to deal with. Again, what are the good consequences? Um, and also consequences to whom or to what? What uh, the consequences are, are relative to those individuals who receive consequences or, or endure consequences. So need I only consider consequences to myself? Or do I have to consider the consequences to the group at large, maybe everyone? Do I have to consider the consequences to the animals? Do I have to consider consequences to the environment? Do I have to cons uh, consider the consequences to um, possible but non-actual non future generations, right? So you give, figure that um, people in the future don't exist, but do I have to consider their consequences anyway? So these again are questions that a consequentialist is going to have to address. And what about when getting good consequences requires violating rights, duties, or other obligations? 
What if it turns out that I could learn a lot about a disease by secretly infecting people with that disease and then watching how it progresses? Well, I might well develop a, a cure for that disease by uh, engaging in that behavior. And so I might get some very good consequences out of that behavior. But it, it seems terribly unjust, right? I'm violating those the autonomy of those individuals. I'm violating their rights. So we're going to see that that consequentialism doesn't actually play nice with deontology. That's the next one we're going to. Now, in terms of um, philosophers who were consequentialist philosophers, we're going to be looking at Epicurus, an ancient Greek hedonist. Then we're going to be looking at more recent philosophers, Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, both writing in the 18th century. Um, and then we'll be looking at consequent, well, we may look at more even recent consequentialists and see how these individuals attempt to answer some of the questions we've just raised. Then the third category of uh, ethical theories that we're going to be looking at is what's called deontological ethics. And deontological ethics is a, a category of ethical theories which see actions as right or wrong, depending on whether or not they accord with correct moral rules. Now, the moral primitive here, the little engine driving these theories, is the notion of the moral rule. Deontology comes from the word deont, which is uh, for duty. So it's a duty-based uh, kind of ethical theory. And the idea here is that we are um, duty-bound to behave in certain ways and to refrain from behaving in other ways. So the notion of the duty or the rule is central to deontological uh, moral theories. Again, here the basic moral primitive is the moral rule. The basic idea is that we are duty bound to obey rules. Keep the rules and you're doing what's right. Break the rules and you're doing what's wrong. Pop quiz. Can, why can Judaism and Christianity be looked at as religious deontological eth ethical systems? Well, perhaps you've already given me the answer. Um, we've got the Ten Commandments, for instance, right? Uh, or, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ox, this sort of thing. Um, or the, the Gordon rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Right? But notice, again, as we mentioned earlier with uh, virtue ethics, this would be a faith-based set of moral rules. And so, again, these would be religious versions of deontological ethical systems, uh, not secular uh, philosophical, strictly speaking. Now, remember, the concept of a moral rule can be expressed through other words, words like duty or rights or obligations or responsibilities or what is forbidden or what is permitted, etc. Notice, anytime one talks about rights, one is saying that there's a certain moral rules governing the behavior. If I said, I have a right to property, that's another way of saying the rule is you should not take my stuff. The assertion that there are human rights, perhaps universal human rights, suggests that humans must be treated in certain rule-governed ways. If not, one is doing something wrong. Anytime one's talking about rights, duties, or obligations, one's talking in deontological terms. Problems with deontological theories? Well, what are these rules and where do they come from? So the, the person proposing a deontological system of ethics is not only going to need to articulate what the rules are, but also explain how they arise, where they come from, and again, what sort of justifies them. Right? How do we come to know these rules? Right? It doesn't seem to be a straightforward empirical matter. It's not like we can do biology to discover these rules. So how do we discover them? The view seems to presume that ethics can be spelled out entirely in terms of rules, but some question whether that's really possible to legislate or articulate rules that are going to cover all real and possible moral issues. I mean, human interactions are very organic, right? They're and, and unpredictable, and uh, you're thrown into situations that perhaps could not have been envisioned. So there may not be a clearly understood rule. There may not be a rule at all that we know in certain situations. Let me come at it a slightly different way. If you're in a, um, let's say, a, a romantic relationship and your significant other starts talking, well, I have rights 
and you're violating my rights. There's a deeper problem with your romantic relationship. And that's not to say that your significant other doesn't have rights. I think, of course, they do, right? The problem is this. When the go-to is, I have rights, that relationship is in deeper problems than rights, right? Uh, and it's not clear that addressing each other's rights is going to rectify whatever that problem might be. There was a, a short-lived pop psychological movement a number of years ago where uh, it was uh, families were encouraged to draw up contracts and they would have a family contract and, and the parents and the children would all get together and they would come up with this contract and they would buy this contract specify all of the duties and all of the responsibilities and all the rights of every member of that family, what they were required to do, what they were entitled to, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea that this would solve all the interpersonal problems within the family because it's all been specified out. Oh, there was that uh, TV show years ago. It's, it's not that many years ago. Um, Big Bang Theory where uh, they had the uh, the roommate contract, which was this incredibly complicated and somewhat comical assemblage of rules. And why was that comical? Uh, well, for the same reason that these, these family contracts were sort of silly, because can we really capture all of the organic interactions within a family by a set of preset, pre-established rules? I don't think so. Um, and then further, who enforces that contract? I mean, if um, the parent isn't doing something they're contractually obligated to do, how is the kid going to enforce that contract? They're not in any kind of symmetric relationship when it comes to the enforcement of that contract. So deontology has its limitations, let's just say. Also, all focus on the moral worth of the agent gets lost when the defense of the action becomes, well, Technically, I wasn't cheating, honey, because, you know, after all, it was just on the internet and I never actually touched her. We never actually had sex. Well, all right, maybe I came right up to the line and didn't cross it, but you don't give me a prize for that. There's, there's nothing admirable about that. And I would say it loses your sense of what moral worth is supposed to be about. There's a further danger of what's called legalism. And legalism is understood as an obsession with the letter as opposed to the spirit of the law. Certain religions uh, as well, have, uh, as moral systems rather, have a tendency towards this kind of legalism to telling you what exactly you must do on, under certain situations. I remember years ago I was reading, um, uh, it was a, a Catholic priest theologian, and he was talking about an experience he had one, one Sunday. He was visiting in another town uh, he attended mass at the local parish where he was visiting. And before mass, he came across um, a, a, church, a church bulletin. And in the church bulletin, they had a column where parishioners could write in to the priest and ask questions about the church or the faith or that sort of thing. So one parishioner had written in to the priest and said, oh, Father, I'm afraid I might have sinned and I need, need your advice here. Um, uh, at uh, Catholic mass, Catholics do something which is called receive Holy Communion. And before they receive Holy Communion, they're supposed to fast. Now, years ago, it was like a real fast where you weren't supposed to eat anything, right? Uh, until uh, you know, from midnight on or something like that. Um, nowadays, it, it's an hour beforehand and Tic Tacs don't count or something like that. So it's not, not quite the rigorous fasting requirement. But anyway, you are still supposed to fast. Um, and uh, you would be receiving the Eucharist unworthily if you didn't fast, and yet you received the Eucharist. Well, this is what she was worried about. And why was she worried? Well, she had been fasting before she received, but then just before she was about to receive, she had a nosebleed, and she swallowed some of the blood. And so her concern was this. Um, did she break the fast by swallowing the blood, and therefore did something wrong by receiving communion? Or was that not really breaking the fast and therefore she did nothing wrong by receiving communion? And so this is what she's asking the priest. Well, the priest wrote back and he said, well, that all depends. If the blood came out of your nose and then into your mouth and you swallowed it, that was eating and you did break the fast. On the other hand, if the blood went down the back of your throat and you swallowed it, then that wasn't eating and you didn't break the fast. Now, 
the, the guy who's recounting this story, the, the priest theologian who's, who's uh, reading this and, and telling about it in his book, uh, he says, look, the problem was not with that priest's response to the parishioner's question. In fact, frankly, what the priest said was entirely accurate. He says, the problem is, what a stupid question, right? I mean, is that really what God is concerned about? Is that what the fasting is all about, right? Uh, isn't it? Aren't we getting too obsessed with the letter of the law and losing sight of the spirit of the law? Well, that's a case coming from Catholicism. I'm not beating up on Catholicism. I'm just trying to illustrate what's what the worry is in legalism, where you've lost sight of what's motivating the rule, um, and you're too concerned with the rule and less uh, what what motivates it or or the the reason for the rule in the first place. So anyway, anytime one's talking about rights, duties, or obligations, one's talking in deontological terms, and we'll be looking at uh, probably only one, but possibly two philosophers, Immanuel Kant, who uh, is a, a later modern philosopher, and W.D. Ross, who's a contemporary philosopher, 20th century philosopher, both of whom were deontologists, and both of whom thought that the key to understanding ethics was the notion of duty. In sum, we tend to reason using all three positions, right? So when trying to make our way through the world, we consider consequences. We consider rights, duties, and obligations. We consider character, uh, uh, integrity, et cetera. So we consider virtue, consequentialist, and deontological um, uh, aspects of the behavior. And I think this is just how we reason normally. And where these views converge, we have vast agreement, right? So if the behavior in question um, is something that's admirable and admirable people engage in, and it's something that has good consequences, and it respects rights and violates no rights, well, we praise it broadly, right? Take uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, admirable woman. Her work had good consequences for the people she served, and she was careful to uh, uh, respect their autonomy and their rights and their dignity. And so we give her a Nobel Peace Prize. Right? On the other hand, um, there was a woman years ago that uh, she was in an acrimonious divorce with her husband, and she was very angry about the divorce. And so she strapped her two toddlers into her SUV and then drove it into a pond, and the kids died. And she told everybody that she had been carjacked by uh, a Black man in the community. Uh, Susan Smith was her name, I believe. Well, that's a horrible thing, right? What a horrible, vile individual. Uh, what terrible consequences to the children, to the community, to the husband. That's why she did it largely, is to get back at him. And violates rights. So everyone agrees. This was a heinous act. It was terrible. There was nobody at the, at the prison saying, free Sm Susan Smith, up with Susan Smith. No, right? So broad universal agreement. But that's why... And why is that, though? Well, because the three perspectives converge in condemning or in recommending the behavior. Moral controversy happens most often when these viewpoints diverge. An action looks good from one perspective, but bad from another. Like the example I gave you about being able to cure uh, a terrible disease, but having to secretly experiment on people without their permission. That's a controversy. The claim that there is no widespread agreement in ethics is a myth, and I believe this is supported by biased observation. For instance, our attention tends to be drawn to controversy and not to agreement. Right? Channel 7 News isn't going to send the news crew down to tell you about 50 people who got together in a room and agreed. But if 25 people are shouting at the other 25 people, oh, yeah, then they'll, they'll send the 19 down to cover that. Well, we tend to have our attention drawn to controversy. Now, we'll go, we're going to be looking at these perspectives as purist perspectives, right? Aristotle, who only recommends virtue and doesn't consider the other alternatives. Immanuel Kant, who really just talks about duties and rules and doesn't look at consequences or virtue. Uh, well, that's not entirely true, but his main emphasis is going to be, um, is going to be rules. And then uh, Epicurus, Bentham, and John Stuart Mill, who look at consequences. So while we tend to think in all three uh, modes, the ones we're going to be looking at, we'll be looking at individual modes. 
onto the second and last half of this presentation, which is looking at ethics and uh, meta-ethical views and the meta-ethical views of relativism and absolutism. So let me just mention that ethical theories are theories that are supposed to tell you what you ought to do. So Kant is going to give you a theory that is going to tell you what you ought to do. Bentham is going to give you a theory that's going to help you figure out what the right thing to do is. Aristotle is going to give you advice on how you should live your life, et cetera, et cetera. So ethical theories direct your behavior, guide your actions. Meta-ethical theories are theories that are about ethical theories. So for instance, when I say ethical theories come in basically three varieties, that's not an ethical statement. That's a meta-ethical statement. In other words, I'm talking about ethical theories. So the next thing we're going to look at is a meta-ethical debate about the nature of ethics. And it's the debate between ethical relativism and ethical absolutism. So I'm going to define them in the following way. Ethical relativism is a theory which states that there are no absolutes. Try that again. Ethical relativism is a theory which states that there are no absolute principles by which to adjudicate, that just means decide between, competing ethical systems. Ethical absolutism, by contrast, is a theory which states that there are absolute principles by which to adjudicate competing ethical systems. Now notice, as I have defined them here, they are diametrically opposed. One cannot be an ethical absolutist and an ethical uh, relativist at the same time. The relativist is denying precisely what the ethical absolutist is asserting. Either there are absolute principles or there are no, but you can't say, well, both. Eh, it doesn't work that way. By the way, I do not distinguish the words ethics and morality here. Um, I'm going to try to use the word ethics exclusively just so I don't confuse people. But if I talk about moral relativism, I mean exactly the same thing as I mean when I say ethical relativism. If I said uh, she is a moral woman, uh, she is an ethical woman, I don't mean anything different there. Right? Or if I say that's a, um, a moral theory or an ethical theory, again, I don't mean anything different. I think in common parlance, uh, we do use these words interchangeably, and I'm not stipulating any definition, uh, distinction here. But again, I'm going to try to use the word ethics just not to throw people off. However, I have a colleague that uh, she does distinguish between ethics and uh, morality. And she says, okay, look, when I use the word ethics, I mean this. And when I use the word morality, I mean that, right? And she does this as a stipulation and it helps her make various points and, and talk about the relationships between different elements in society and sources of moral instruction and that sort of stuff. So it serves a purpose for her, but I don't have that need and I don't make that distinction in this class. Now, I do distinguish between ethical relativism and cultural relativism. Cultural relativism is the view that different cultures have different ethical systems. But I don't take that to be a philosophical claim at all. That's simply um, an historical, anthropological, sociological claim, right? As a matter of empirical fact, it turns out that different cultures have different ethical systems, different sets of ethical beliefs, values, etc. Right. So I take that to be true, for one, and also not a philosophical claim. Right. But do not confuse the meta-ethical theory of ethical relativism with the descriptive anthropological theory of cultural relativism. All right, before talking about ethical relativism, I want to talk about some non ethical examples of relative judgments, systems of relative judgments. And these are other systems of relative judgments you're already familiar with, and that'll make it easier to understand what the ethical relativist is claiming. So let's take fashion first, right? Let's say that uh, one day I show up to class, uh, you know, and uh, this week or something like that, and I'm wearing a polyester mint green leisure suit uh, with a, uh, uh, a nylon a fake silk shirt and lots of gold chains. Oh, and platform shoes. Is that fashionable? Would I be wearing something fashionable if I presented myself that way uh, to class next week or something like that? Well, some of you might be hesitant in responding, uh, but I'll respond on your behalf. No, 
that would not be fashionable. Right? Uh, that's just not what our current fashion is. And if I presented myself that way, I would be committing a fashion faux pas, one might say. Was it always unfashionable to wear a mint green polyester leisure suit with a, you know, a, a fake nylon silk shirt and lots of gold chains and platform shoes for, for men? No, it was fashionable at one time. I know I was alive at the time. <laughs> that was fashionable. Um, Google 1970s fashions for men you might be horrified, but you'd also be educated to something, right? So notice it was fashionable in the 1970s, but it's not fashionable now. Right? So I want to make a couple of points here. There is such a thing as fashion truth. Some things are fashionable and some things are not fashionable. Right? And that's independent of what I might think about it. Right? So that's one thing. But make, I want to make a second uh, further point. That truth, that fashion truth is da, 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 relative, meaning it depends on time, place, and culture. So when I say that is unfashionable, well, consciously or unconsciously, I always have to finish the thought. That's unfashionable for us here now. Or I might say that is fashionable for them there then. And if some of you were hesitant about telling me my mint green leisure suit was unfashionable, you might have had precisely that in mind. You might have been thinking, well, okay, for us, that wouldn't be fashionable, but there was a time and place. And, and you're quite right, right. So there is such a thing as fashion truth, but that truth is always relative. It's relative to time. It's relative to place. It's relative to culture. We literally dream up these rules, right? Oh, it has something to do with, I don't know, Paris, uh, runways and and Milan and and Madrid and uh, celebrities and maybe Beyonce or I mean so it's an interesting question how is it that what is fashionable comes to be fashionable uh, how does it cease to be fashionable I think those are all interesting questions but notice a couple of things number one I don't need to know what the answer to those questions are to know that something things are fashionable and some things are not and if I want to be fashionable. I have to go and find out what is the current fashion, right? I'm going to have to subscribe to GQ or L or Mademoiselle or one of these other publications and find out what's in this year, right? Animal prints, are they in? I don't know. Right? Um, and not only do I need to find out, but if I care about being fashionable, I have to conform my behavior to the rules, to the rules as created by and uh, endorsed by society. Being fashionable means conforming to the fashion rules that society creates, endorses, and enforces, right? And these rules change from time to time, and what was fashionable last summer may not be fashionable this summer. I don't know. Frankly, I'm not that concerned. But if I was, I know what I'd have to do. All right, so that's the nature of fashion. It's uh, it's not subjective, right? I might say, oh, well, this is fashionable for me. Mm -hmm. Fashion doesn't work that way. I cannot, by sheer force of will, make something fashionable. Uh, if I could, I would probably bring back the platform shoes for guys because I'm short and I could use the height, right? But I can't. I can't make them fashionable. Right? Now, maybe I mean this. I don't care about fashion. I like to fly in the face of fashion. Well, that's fine. But it doesn't change the fact that me wearing a mint green leisure suit with platform shoes tomorrow, next week, would be doing something unfashionable. All right. Notice the same sort of thing is going on with etiquette, right? There used to be a very fancy uh, hotel. Well, there still is a very fancy hotel behind St. Pat's Cathedral in Manhattan. Uh, it was called uh, the Helmsley Palace. I think it's called the New York Palace now. And one could take one's afternoon tea at the Helmsley Palace. It's a nice thing to do, right? So imagine one of you and I, uh, I take you to the, 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 the palace, New York Palace, what I think it's called. And, uh, and we walk in for our four o'clock tea. And they say, would you care for harp or piano? Well, I don't know. I think I'm, let's do harp today. So they lead us to the harp room and there the harpist is playing and they seat us and they bring us our tea and they bring us our outrageously expensive uh, uh, biscuits. And then you take your tea and you pour it into the saucer and you start drinking your tea. 
from the saucer? Have you done something that is a breach of etiquette? Have you done something that one ought not do? It's impolite, it's rude. Well, hopefully you know, yes, you have done something. Because if you don't know that, I will not be taking you to the Helmsley Palace anytime soon. Right? This one does not drink one's tea from one's saucer. Was it always impolite to drink your tea from the saucer? No, actually, that's what saucers were created for. Initially, you could take the scalding hot tea, pour it into the saucer, which had the greater surface area, it would cool more quickly and you could drink it. Yeah. Um, and this was perfectly appropriate in the 1700s. Right? I think George Washington at one point um, made the sort of metaphor that uh, the, the, the Senate is the saucer into which the hot passions of the House of Representatives spills, right? Again, giving it more time to cool off and or, or uh, cooler heads prevail, supposedly. Um, because that was the custom at the time. I've been told uh, by a student of mine who is from India that it's still appropriate if you were, say, having a tea at an outdoor cafe and a friend came by, uh, the appropriate thing to do would be to take some of your tea and pour it into the saucer so that you could share your tea with your friend. I can't, I can't tell you for sure that that's true. I've never been to India, but this is what she told me. And I'm assuming she wasn't just trying to fool me. So perhaps there are still times and places where drinking one's tea from one's saucer is polite, is etiquette, right? but not here and now, right? So etiquette rules, just like fashion rules, have jurisdiction. They are rules that are created by society. They're endorsed by society. They're enforced by society. But for that reason, they only have jurisdictions for the society that creates and enforces them, and only so long as the society chooses to enforce them. And clearly, we can see with law, Law literally has jurisdictions. Right? Is it illegal uh, to purchase recreational marijuana? Well, depends on your jurisdiction, doesn't it? Right now, you might say, well, it's legal in Colorado to uh, purchase recreational marijuana, but it's illegal in Miami. I think it still is. It's illegal in Miami to purchase recreational marijuana. But which is it really, right? Is Colorado right? It's really legal and Miami's wrong. It's really not legal. Um, uh, it, uh, it, it, it's really not illegal rather. Or is Miami right? It's really illegal and Colorado's wrong. They're mistaken to think it's legal. Well, you see that that's a silly question. It really is legal for them there then. And it really is illegal from for us here now. And what the legal relativist will go on to say is there are no absolute principles by which to adjudicate competing legal systems. It's not like our laws are more legal than their laws or their laws are more legal than our laws. No, there's no way to make that kind of assessment. Likewise with etiquette. You can't say their etiquette rules are more polite than ours or ours are more polite than theirs. They're just different. There are no absolute principles to make that kind of judgment and likewise with fashion. There are no absolute principles by which to adjudicate competing fashion systems. Okay, so long enough on this slide, you suppose? I think now we're on to what to take away here, fashion. There is such a thing as fashion truth, but it's relative. Some things are fashionable and some things are not, but this truth is relative to time, place, and culture. When one claims that X is fashionable, one must always complete the thought, either consciously or unconsciously, relative to some why. And what is fashionable relative to 1980s America, say Miami Vice jackets, may not be fashionable to today's America. Fashion rules are created by culture and therefore only have jurisdiction for the culture that created them and only so long as that culture continues to enforce them. Fashion means what is culturally accepted, endorsed, or admired by the group, and these things change from time to time. To make something fashionable, you need a culture, not an individual. And if you care about being fashionable, you need to go and find out what the rules are and then conform your behavior accordingly. Note, it makes no sense to say, oh, I know that this culture thinks that's fashionable, but is it really fashionable for them? No, if they think it's fashionable for them, it's fashionable for them. If they think it's legal for them, it's legal for them. If they think it's polite for them, then it's polite for them. 
Notice that the relativist is not saying, it's not saying that nothing is really fashionable. No, of course, that's ridiculous. Uh, of course, things are fashionable, right? Just ask L or GQ. Notice they aren't saying what's fashionable for me may not be fashionable for you. That's not what the relativist is saying. If we belong to the same group, then the same rules apply to both of us. The fashion rules that apply to me are the fashion rules that apply to you. Now, you might say, oh, yes, but you're a 60-year-old man and I'm a 20-year-old uh, 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 non, yeah, uh, well, whomever, right? Uh, so 20-year-olds, 60-year-olds, they don't dress the same. Right? Fair enough. Maybe we don't belong to the same group, right? In this case, the rules that apply to me maybe are not the rules that apply to you, but that's because we don't apply, we don't belong to the same group. Now, that's a little bit of a tricky issue. How do you determine what group you belong to when rules apply? But we'll save that for a bit later. Well, even though everyone claims it's that's fashionable, um, it's, uh, wait, let's try that again. Even though everyone claims that this is not fashionable, my mint green leisure suit, for instance, this is fashionable for me. No, fashion doesn't work that way. One misuses the term to think otherwise. Right? All right, so notice the ethical relativist is saying the same thing about ethics, right? They think ethics works the same way. There is such a thing as ethical truth. Some things are ethical and some things are not ethical. But this truth is relative to time, place, and culture. When one claims blah, blah, blah is unethical, one must always complete the thought consciously or consciously relative to some why. That's not ethical for them there then. Or this is ethical for us here now. Nothing is absolutely ethical or absolutely unethical. And uh, what's uh, ethical for 1980s America may not be ethical for today's America. Again, ethics is created by culture. This is what they claim. And therefore, ethical rules only have jurisdiction for the cultures that created them, that enforce them, and only so long as the culture chooses to continue to enforce them. Fashion or ethics means what is culturally accepted, endorsed, or admired by the group. And these things can and do change from time to time. To make something ethical, you need a culture, not an individual. So the ethical relativist is not an ethical subjectivist. They're claiming there's, there's something more uh, that, that transcends the individual when it comes to ethics. And if you care about being ethical, you have to find out what the ethical rules are, and you have to conform your behavior accordingly. And again, it makes no sense to say, oh, I know that that culture thinks what they're doing is ethical, but is it really ethical? Eh. If they think it's ethical for them, then it is ethical for them. Again, they're not saying nothing is really ethical. They're not really saying what's ethical for me is not ethical for you. And they're not saying that um, uh, even though everybody says what I'm doing is unethical, it's not unethical. It's ethical for me. And it doesn't work that way. Now, if I were to say, well, I know that in the 1980s, those Miami Vice jackets were considered fashionable. And today we do not consider them fashionable, but what I want to know is, are they really fashionable or not? Who's right about this? The fashion relatives would respond, what a silly question. They really are fashionable for the 1980s, not just considered, and they really are unfashionable for us, not just considered, and there are no absolute principles by which to adjudicate competing fashion systems. But the ethical relativist is saying the same thing about ethics. Oh, I know that was considered unethical years ago, but today we consider it ethical now. But I want to know who's right. Is it really ethical like we think, or is it really unethical like they thought years ago? Well, the ethical relativist is going to say, what a silly question. It really was unethical for them there then, and it's really ethical for us here now, and there are no absolute principles by which to adjudicate competing ethical systems. I said that. I said that. The relativist believes that ethics is just like fashion in this respect. Ethical rules are created by society and only have jurisdiction for the society which created them. Further, there are no absolute principles to determine what is right and wrong. However, the relativist does not say that one makes up the rules oneself. If one cares about being ethical, one must find out what the rules are and abide by the ethical rules of society. One is bound by the same rules as others in that culture. 
Uh, and there are such things as moral truths, but they are relative depending on time, place, and culture, et cetera. Now, reasons for supporting ethical relativism. Well, widespread moral disagreement seems to suggest that maybe there is no objectivity to ethics. There is no fixed nature to ethical rules, et cetera, because we've changed our mind over the centuries and, and there's still a lot of disagreement from culture to culture even now. And there doesn't seem to be any universally accepted way of resolving these kinds of disagreements. So ethical relativism can tolerate that kind of disagreement, whereas a commitment to ethical absolutism seems to resist that kind of um, uh, irresolvable disagree. Second, it also seems to avoid ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is the unjustified use of one's own ethnic group's standards as the objective standards by which to judge others for no other reason than they are your own, right? So in other words, if you said, well, my culture is the right culture and other cultures are correct only to the extent they, they approximate mine, well, that's a view called ethical uh, ethnocentrism, uh, suggesting that yours is the only correct one and everything else needs to be judged relative to, to you or your, your ethnic group or your ethnic culture. Right? It seems unjustified, seems prejudicial, and, uh, and relativism would, would reject that. Right? And then further, it seems to avoid imperialism, and imperialism is a particularly um, uh, uh, unpleasant uh, companion sometimes to ethnocentrism. So not only do you think your culture's view is right, you think your job is to make everybody else abide by your view of what's right and wrong, right? It's the practice of imposing values, traditions, and practices on another culture by force and coercion. So this is the view of imperialism. Now, traditional philosophical ethical theories have been absolutist. And they have suggested that what is right is right, regardless of time, place, or culture. Western cultures have often been imperialistic, trying to replace the native views, practices, and customs with their own, because they believed that it was in their, uh, their job to educate and civilize people, right? So notice when uh, colonizers came over to uh, uh, the North American content, uh, continent and they discovered individuals in, indigenous individuals who had different religious practices, moral practices, um, uh, marriage practices, etc. Uh, they didn't say, oh, let's celebrate diversity. No, no, no. They said, stop that, stop that, stop that. You're doing things the wrong way. You have to do the things the right way and the right way is our way. Right? And so our job is to educate and civilize you. Now that view is very much criticized today. Um, during the 20th century, groundbreaking work was done in anthropology, and uh, one particularly prominent uh, anthropologist, Margaret Mead, studied the natives of Samoa, and her work, now somewhat suspect, uh, caused a big stir in the 1950s. According uh, to her findings, the Samoans had very relaxed uh, and tolerant attitudes towards sexual relationships, and this contrasted sharply with the sexual mores of Americans in the 1950s. But in addition to her empirical findings, this describing how things happen to be over in Samoa, she also advanced the philosophical meta-ethical view that there are uh, no culture's morals are morally superior to any others because there are no absolute principles by which to adjudicate competing ethical systems. So in addition to the cultural relativism, that's just the description stuff, she also advanced um, ethical relativism. It would seem to follow, if that's true, it would seem to follow that the proper or enlightened or cosmopolitan thing to do uh, is not to try to change them, but to accept their cultural beliefs and to accept that they're simply different. This view is not really that new relativism. I mean, granted, it perhaps became more prominent in, uh, from the 1950s on in, in the United States, etc. But it goes at least as far back as the Greek philosopher Protagoras, um, who declared that man is the measure of all things. Or Hamlet famously says, for there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so, right? And we seem to uh, draw up these, these, uh, these measures, these rules, etc. But there are problems 
for ethical relativism. Oh, I should, before going on to the problems, sometimes when I would be teaching this uh, course in person, I would poll the class at this point and say, well, as I've laid things out, how many of you would identify as an ethical relativist? And you think that this is the correct view of ethics. And very often the majority of the class, I think one time it was almost all but one person accepted this as being the case, right? So it's so a widely popular view. But now I think I want to point out what some of the problems with this view are, because they may not be immediately clear. For one thing, if ethical relativism were true, then we could not criticize cross-culturally. Right? Going for the alliteration there, eh? Um, but what if the, what that other culture is doing is uh, a, a, a human atrocity, right? Is grossly inhumane, uh, such as genocide. True relativists would say that we can't criticize that culture if what they're doing is coherent with their own idea of morality, that they're following their own moral rules consistently. The most we could say is, oh, we wouldn't do that over here, right? Oh, you know, um, killing all those people, uh, wiping out that, that ethnic minority. Well, that's not something we would do over here. But isn't that an impossibly pale response to a moral outrage? Seems to me the answer to that is yes, it is. Right? So that's an uncomfortable implication of ethical relativism. What do you do in the face of uh, crimes against humanity? But second, if true, you couldn't criticize intra-culturally. What do I mean by that? Well, what if the majority of the culture believed that slavery is permissible? Historically, moral reformers, abolitionists, for instance, claimed that the majority was wrong, and they pointed to a higher standard to make their moral criticisms of their own culture's practices. But this is precisely what ethical relativism denies, the existence of such higher standards. Notice, if the majority of my culture claims that X is fashionable, and you disagree, you're the one that's wrong. On a similar view of ethics, it would be the moral reformers who are making the incorrect moral judgments. Because if the majority says that institutionalized slavery, slavery is morally permissible, then it's morally permissible for them. Right? And the abolitionists are simply out of step with culture. That would be like me wearing my mint green leisure suit and insisting that it's fashionable. Number three, if ethical relativism were true, we could not make sense of the notion of moral progress. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'd like to think that we are more moral as a culture than we used to be, and that we have maybe a ways to go, maybe more progress to make in that same regard. So I do adhere to the notion that societies can engage in moral progress, and perhaps more troubling, they can engage in moral regress. They can move backwards morally. But notice the movement from A to B here. Right? How could we call that progress? Well, notice we can't call the movement from A to B progress if those are the only two things we're looking at. The only way we could judge the movement from A to B as progressive is if the movement from A to B is moving us further towards a goal. In other words, if there were some absolute standard by which to adjudicate these two moral systems relative to some third coordinate movement from A to B would be progressive. Now moving from B to A would be regressive. But that makes sense only if there exists absolute standards by which to adjudicate competing ethical systems. If relativism were true, we cannot say that we are progressing, we're just changing. Progress entails the idea of moving towards a goal, not merely evolving. Fashion does not progress in the strictest sense. If bell-bottom jeans came back in style, this would not be fashion regress, such that we are less fashionable than we used to be. However, if institutional slavery ever came back, well, that would be moral regress. We would be less moral than we used to be, or at least so I maintain. But that seems to be reason for thinking that moral relativism is false. Number four, uh, one cannot seemingly support the notion of universal human rights and be a moral relativist or an ethical relativist. And why is that? Well, because the notion of universal human rights suggests that you're entitled to be treated in certain ways, regardless of what culture you happen to be in, 
uh, or what that culture thinks is moral or immoral. And then almost finally, I have one other point after this, but uh, if one is committed to the position that imperialism is wrong, right? Imposing your views on another culture by force and coercion is wrong and it violates their autonomy or what have you, right? And you go on to say it was wrong when the Romans did it. It was wrong when the British did it. It was wrong when the Spanish did it and the Incas and the Aztecs and the Chinese and the Mongols and the Japanese, et cetera, et cetera. Well, one is starting to sound like an absolutist, not a relativist. Notice the Romans didn't think what they were doing was wrong. In fact, the Romans thought what they were doing was noble. They were justified. They're bringing Roman law to the world or civilizing the world. But if you want to say, ah, but you're using force to do this, you're using coercion, that's what's wrong. Well, you seem to be suggesting it's absolutely wrong, not just wrong from your culture's perspective. And then also, this came up a bit earlier, what do we mean by culture? So I have to know what group do I belong to? Um, is there a global culture now such that I'm subject to global rules? Um, do I belong to a subculture uh, that, that uh, exists within a dominant culture? And if I do, am I more subject to the rules of my subculture than the dominant culture? Or do I need to obey the rules of the dominant culture and ignore the rules of the subculture? So membership in what groups becomes problematic. Ethical relativism claims that ethical rules arise from culture and we literally draw, dream this stuff up. Ethical absolutists claim that ethical rules are like science, that there is an objectivity to ethics and that like science, there are ethical facts which we discover and about which entire cultures can be wrong. So in the days when faculty still received uh, sample textbooks on the idea that maybe you might adopt them. I remember in one week receiving two textbooks. I was teaching a course on ethics regularly at that time, and I received two sample textbooks. One was entitled Ethics, Inventing Right and Wrong, and the other was entitled Ethics, Discovering Right or Wrong. And I just thought that was you know, ironic, but also it perfectly crystallizes the debate between the ethical relativist and the ethical absolutist. The ethical relativist is suggesting that we make this stuff up, we invent it like fashion, like law, like etiquette. And the ethical absolutist suggests, on the other hand, that we discover it, more like we discover objective facts about the world. Now, there are problems with, oh, I remember then at this point, I had a student raise her hand and go, well, professor, why would anyone be an ethical relativist then? Oh, excellent, I can see my work is done here. <laughs> But no, there's plenty of reasons why one might be an ethical relativist. One is, uh, what are these supposed absolute standards, right? Articulating them. And number two, how do you know that you're not just favoring your own ethnic preferences and acting as if they're somehow ultimate standards? In other words, you're sneaking in your favorites and then calling them somehow absolute and objective. You know, uh, China regularly accuses the United States of doing this sort of thing when we criticize them on human rights abuses. And they're saying, no, you're just imposing your own um, view of ethics on us and leave us alone. We have our own view of ethics over here. So. Well, that concludes this uh, introductory lecture. I hope you found it useful and helpful. Naturally, if you have any problems or any questions, uh, by all means, contact me. I'd be happy to address them. Have a pleasant rest of your day.